Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit Sprint Demo Meeting for January 23rd, 2018. Woohoo! Woo again. Yes, yeah, so we've got some good stuff to talk about today, so let's just hop on in. Um, so let's talk about some stats so that people recognize uh, open pull requests. Uh, this is over the last three months, so the last quarter, starting from today back. Um, you see, since since the you know 23rd of October, we were about here. We we got this nice little bump down here, trying to you know trending back down. Um, but definitely, we've had had some activity over the the you know uh, winter break and you know the what would be holiday period in the U.S. Yeah, and so it's been been good. Just yeah, there's certainly a lot of cool stuff coming in. Absolutely, we like that. Speaking of uh, stuff coming in, here's uh, some more stats with anybody uh, keeping score at home. The top committers over the last uh, month or so, Brent is crushing it. Thank you, Brent. There's Will. Hi, Will. Um, Way, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we really appreciate everybody uh, who's contributed to Metasploit. Uh, it's great. Tell your friends. Uh, something, <laughs> like, yeah. like and subscribe? No, like and sub no, no that, was, that was earlier. That okay. was earlier. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, clone and clone push. Clone and push. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Go fork. No fork. <laughs> Go fork. Go fork. Go forth and fork. All right. Uh, it's a Metasploit 5 stuff coming down the pipe. You want to talk about yes, that? Yes, I'm super excited. So, yeah, I've been threatening. I'm, I think we've been threatening for probably three years to, to create Metasploit 5 or something, or at least start Metasploit 5. And so yeah, what we did, after a lot of work to make sure that all the underlying infrastructure that relied on Metasploit 4 uh, continued to be exactly the way it is, uh, continues to use it. So Metasploit Pro, uh, Kali Linux, Arch Linux, Parrot, Sec mm -hmm. Linux, um, a pen tester toolkit, Omnibus builds, um, there's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes um, before we said, let's start Metasploit 5 development that we did to make sure that uh, people had a continuing stable Metasploit release train that we could you know, start doing some experimenting on a uh, sort of an unstable branch. So as of last week, Metasploit 5 is now the master branch in GitHub. Wow. So if you check it out, you'll use it. Um, a neat thing, the very first thing we landed was something that removed all the module metadata out of the Postgres database. Now what we're, we're aiming for, um, in, in the next few weeks is, and hopefully the next few weeks, I'm always wrong in these estimates, but soon, <laughs> uh, I should say that, we're going to be working on actually redoing the whole Metasploit data model, making it so that actually Metasploit can push data and interact with external data sources like outside of like Postgres. And um, we, we actually have this really cool uh, data, external data service that's going to externalize it, make it really easy to integrate with other tools, other platforms, that sort of thing. But uh, one of our first steps was to get the module metadata out of the database so it could run independently. Um, uh, this is something that Chris Lee worked on. He's our architect here with the offensive security team. And um, and it's pretty cool. What it does is it basically just stores all the module metadata as a um, like standalone file that gets read on startup. And it actually it's stored inside of inside of GitHub um, as, a, as a file. So you don't even have to regenerate this on startup. Um, and it basically makes Metasploit one, um, if you don't have a database turned on, it still is able to search modules really quickly. Um, uh, before it would say using slow search and would take you know 35 seconds to search for a module. Now right. it just happens instantaneously. The other neat thing is it uses 100 megabytes less memory nice. because we're not storing the data in kind of inefficient format. So there's a lot more stuff that we've got kind of in the pipeline for, for Metasploit 5. Um, if you look at the pull request uh, that merged this, uh, it has it all kind of enumerated, and we also talked about it in the blog post this last week. So I won't go into too much other detail from here, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff in the works. And um, it'll probably be uh, maybe a little fluid as far as where we end up with, um, but I think we have a lot of the core pillars uh, in mind, and, and I'm really looking forward to uh, releasing it by... I don't know. Don't say it. You said you're, you're back. I'm not going to say it. All right. I'm just going to think it. Okay. There you yeah. go. I wish we to find a start. We're releasing it, yeah. period. Absolutely. Um, so this, and this applies to, you said, if you clone framework, you're going to get Metasploit 5, but the installers themselves, if you use the Omnibus installer or whatnot, you'll you'll still get the stable Metasploit. Exactly. Power. So if you're on Kali Linux, if you're using Metasploit Pro, if you're on uh, using the Omnibus installers, so you're using Parrot, using whatever, we're going to continue tagging Metasploit 4 releases until we're ready with 5. Right on. Very cool. Thank you, Ryan. Hmm? All right, and with that, let's talk about things that have landed. Uh, we've had quite a few uh, RC exploit modules, some of which landed prior to our previous meeting, but there was so much the last time we didn't get them get them all all called out here. And some of which have just recently landed, like as of you know last night or yeah, maybe, maybe some even, of those were from even last maybe night. this morning, depending yeah. on on time. Yeah. Um, any particular uh, ones you'd like to talk about, Brent? Are you found? Well, I, I, I want to point out that, that go-ahead one. It's very interesting. Um, so you might remember last year, there was a uh, an exploit that had a nice main vulnerability. It was called Samba Cry. It was right after the whole WannaCry sort of you know malware that went around. And so people sort of leveraged that name and created this thing called Samba Cry. I think it had a, a different name as well. But um, uh, the idea was that 
uh, you could trick Samba into loading uh, a piece of shared library code into its own process space and uh, and then executing that code. Because basically, if you load any kind of code, there's usually hook functions that say, uh, here's like read a file, write a file, whatever. It's like a plugin. And so you basically, any arbitrary user could trick Samba into loading a plugin and running code. Um, this go ahead web server, which is an embeddable web server that runs on lots of different embedded platforms, um, you know, DVRs, uh, routers, uh, you know, uh, NAS devices. Um, what it also was able to do is you could actually send it a DLL or really a shared library over um, or an HTTP request, and it would load it into memory and then execute your code. So uh, this is one of these cases where it's like literally the same vulnerability where it just didn't authenticate who was sending it. Like here's you know some shared library code, it would just load it, um, and that's really kind of great because well, it's not great for you know, patching, <laughs> but. Uh, um, it's kind of interesting from an exploitation point of view because effectively uh, all these sort of embedded devices, no really way to tell if they, they're patched or not. You can just, but you can really safely check to see if they're vulnerable by just by uploading a payload and it goes, oh, okay, execute it. It's very, very safe and easy to do. Um, something we did do some analysis on for this module was to see what the exposure in the world was. And I think, well, if you recall correctly, there were about maybe just a couple thousand endpoints actually exposed on the internet. So it sounded like, it was going to be a pretty limited exposure vulnerability, but depending on like what's internal inside of networks, that there's potentially a lot of impact there. Um, but this is actually something that HD Moore worked on, um, and it's 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 but it's uh, kind of cool because it's that same sort of class of bug, the the injecting payloads into a, um, a process as a plugin instead, and using its own functionality against it. Um, well, another kind of neat thing that Metasploit is able to do from a, from a vulnerability check point of view is it works even if it doesn't know if the service is running that particular service. It's able to check it without doing version checks or anything like that. It also works, I think, across 11 different architectures. So whether it's an embedded device that has MIPS or ARM or x86 or even uh, an S390 mainframe processor, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. the, the vulnerability should work. That's awesome. Very cool. Now let's see, we've got more things that landed as well. Um, Anyone's particular here? The, the, the interesting one, I'll, I'll call out the local exploit modules, uh, the privilege escalation via VMware Workstation is done via an ALSA config file. That's right. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, so VMware always likes to make things easy for people. And in the process, it <laughs> makes it easy for exploiters as well. And so this is really a feature that VMware was able to automatically read different config files and you just give it a specially crafted config file and it goes flat. <laughs> you have code execution. There you go. So, uh, or, or privilege escalation. So, pretty neat stuff there. Very cool. All right, and some more things that landed. Uh, oh, uh, one enhancement element to call out was uh, Will dropped in a register directories for cleanup. Yeah. So now when you're done, you, your module's done, you can have it automatically clean up after the mess you made and whatnot. Anything you dropped, yeah. Yes. That's pretty cool. It's, it's 99% 90, less messy than it was before. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there you go. Um, it was less messy. We actually we added support for UTF names and for, for module names and authors. We actually yeah. for, for, weren't able to do that because Mesplit Pro didn't have an ask, had an ASCII database rather than a UTF-8. That's right. Uh, yeah. We got that fixed last year, and so now it's safe enough to do now. now. And I think we, are, we got our first commit that added an umlaut. We did. To, yeah. uh, to handle books name. The umlaut appreciation thread. Exactly. Is, uh, it's great. As, as Beacles called it, yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, some good stuff. Um, I, I know the Java JMX server is kind of an interesting one in that uh, a lot of pen testers use this on engagements because it's one of those cases where it's not really a vulnerability, it's just a configuration issue. And so you'll find it in a lot of different places. And so uh, one of the uh, pen testers that uses Metasploit um, uh, added this support and now it can target IBM, JDK, as well as uh, Oracle's and um, Sun's old stuff. We basically added support for pretty much every variation that we could find. Um, so nice. it'd be kind of a neat thing there. Yeah. And MSF Packet Dispatcher Callback Refactor. I know that sounds like, what the hell are they talking about? I'm sorry, I didn't <laughs> use, you know, whatever. Um, we'll but that that's actually a neat interlude. What that's going to lead into is something UDP-based that we may be able to run an ah. interpreter on top of. Um, so that's, that's not interesting by itself, but a PR is in the works yeah, yeah, soon. Yeah. They'll, We'll talk about that the next step. So it's a teaser. Yeah, it's a teaser. We also got uh, DNS, uh, uh, some DNS support added to the That's work, yeah. more of the teaser. Yeah. 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 So you can keep, keep your oh, eyes no. peeled. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Well, well. Very cool. And so about things in the works. A um, whole lot of stuff. I used to work at BMC, so the BMC server automation agent was kind of funny to see show up. Hello. <laughs> 
And we scan our module, the uh, shark, uh, shark ATTO. I don't yeah. know. A lot of uh, ATT universe uh, routers out there. So, uh, so that's, that's an interesting one. Not really specifically for the scanner. Scanner's cool. Uh, we, we put out that vulnerability as part of the Rapid 7 disclosure program. And um, we, I think, Todd Beard, our own Todd's Beards, we got to name it. Oh, but um, what I think is really interesting about this scanner module is it is our first Python based scanner module that uses the Cold Stone API. Right. And the other cool thing about it is it actually adds a class called a uh, sonar study class. And the idea behind this is um, Rapid7 runs, runs a project called Sonar, which basically scans the internet for vulnerabilities. Now, whenever you scan the internet for vulnerabilities and you don't want to have like uh, the FBI knocking on your door, um, there's certain limitations to what you should do. So basically this, 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 uh, this sonar study module allows you to sort of enumerate what you want the, the scanner to do, but it also keeps you within the legal confines of what you can do across the internet without getting, you know, people getting uh, warrants for you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the neat thing about it basically is that it allows you to do a safe internet-wide scan, and we're actually working to make it so that these modules can run directly within the sonar infrastructure. So we'll be able to also publish studies um, of how well did this module do across the internet, and then you can use the same Metasploit module that's literally running the same code across your own internal environment to see what your internal exposure as well. So looking for more of these, this is our first test case, um, but there, we hope to have many more in the future. Yeah, that's super cool. All that Python support. Um, more things in the works. Oh, it's so much we got, stuff. We've got a lot of Linux privilege escalations, as you can see there. Yeah. Um, I think actually all three of those may have come from B. Coles. Thank you, B. Coles. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Brendan. <laughs> yeah. he, he's been a real rock star this, Absolutely. this, this month. I think he's, Absolutely. he should be the top contributor on that list. It should not be me. But, we need to land this stuff. Yeah. So we need. Oh, mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, yeah. And we got an X8 a, a, a stager for Mac OS. I think it supports iOS as well, which basically well, means we'll be able to do there. process injection on Mac OS and iOS, uh, which has some pretty cool possibilities in the future. There you go. We'll have to see. Yeah. And oh darn it, the cat's out of the bag anyway. Reverse DNS transfer from interpreter. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's coming along. Cool. Very nice. Yay. Uh, some team updates. Dharma Initiative. Namaste. Who would like to give that one? Namaste. Hi, Adam. Hi. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of new team members coming over, uh, which is pretty fun. Already hard at work. Uh, Aaron Soto landed his first PR on like his second or third day, uh, which was fun. Uh, and this is Jacob Robel's second day, so hopefully he can get his first PR landed today as well. Um, been doing some of the... Uh, external module and sonar work that Brent covered. Uh, it's pretty fun. We've got, uh, I'm getting some pretty good performance out of that. And also a lot of bug fixes and quality of life type things uh, that Will especially has been spearheading. Uh, some really cool stuff that makes Metasploit a little bit uh, less surprising in post-exploitation. Yeah. Very right. cool. Awesome, thanks Adam. Script kiddies. Namaste, or whatever you script kiddies say. <laughs> no. Anybody? Going once? I'm just going to read the slide. All right. I well, I can talk a little bit. Why don't you talk a little bit? Oh, I love talking. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Talking's the best. Anyway, um, so uh, so payload testing is con continues to, to payload test along. Uh, yeah. We've been making some changes to make it so that it, it uh, doesn't explode the uh, the testing machine every time we run it. So it's probably one good. test at a time rather than 27 tests simultaneously, and we run out of RAM. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, we've actually got it all hooked into GitHub now. So actually, when you push a PR up, it actually runs all the payload testing, or at least starts to uh, in the background. So that's a really cool thing, too. Yeah, right. So soon we'll have, uh, again, my, my qualified soon, but yeah. I, I hope really <laughs> Published payload testing pushed up too. So when someone says test all the things, it just happens. Um, command exec fixes, like I talked about, thanks to Brendan Coles for writing up all those great unit tests for it. Um, we have process renaming support, which is basically a way to hide processes from people. And I'm going to be demonstrating that a little bit later. Um, it's actually kind of been in the payloads for a while. I just never exposed it. We, we had some folks go on to ShmooCon. Um, uh, Brandon, did you want to give us any kind of update, or, or Aaron, on, on, or Brendan, sorry, um, on how that went? Uh, sure, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. So Brendan, I spent a little bit of time kind of uh, pre-con, kind of working through some ubiquity stuff. But otherwise, at Shmoo, uh, I mean, there's a good variety of, of talks just in general, but uh, certainly some, uh, some really interesting stuff in, in the RF spectrum, but also 
uh, just in, in kind of a bit of a defensive side. Honestly, to me, the value of Shmoo was, was to kind of talk with folks about some of the, the things that even in just my first few weeks here, I'm hearing rumblings in, in our community of, of things that we want mm -hmm. uh, and got a lot of excitement for some of the things that are coming down the pipe. So um, anyway, yeah, it was, it was just kind of fun to, to connect with folks and, uh, and, and get them excited about some of our developments, things we talked about in our, uh, you know, what's coming up slides. Oh, fantastic. So you might call it more of a schmooze con. <laughs> I'm but sorry. Then, I, no, no, should, should no, I pull no. that back? I'm just, okay. just going right. to edit just that. Just edit out. that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay. And uh, I believe MSF term has come along too. The, uh, uh, Bill, Bill's been working on that. That's a uh, thing that lets you Continue typing commands at the command line while other stuff continues scrolling. So basically, split screen support for nice. So it doesn't I'll get it all jumbled up. Very cool. Thank you. Really. Abnormal form. Yeah. So as Brent mentioned uh, earlier, the module cache improvements uh, have landed. So I won't really spend much more time on that. Um, we also have been doing a lot of work in the background trying to build out. In, you know the groundwork for the work that we're doing as far as the client server. So we went through and had a number of discussions where we kind of came up and defined API standards and updated both the client server code accordingly. Uh, we got some code in there to de deserialize from uh, JSON into MDM objects in memory, which is allowing us to do the conversion uh, a little bit faster. I think long-term goals will be possibly moving away from that. But in the interim, that's just going to let us uh, get to the work a little bit faster. And we also have the HVS support is in uh, progress currently. And hopefully that'll actually be landed today. And just so people kind of know the context of what this work is leading into, eventually we're going to make it use this to be able to integrate with other products within Rapid7 as well. Uh, we've got some some things we're thinking about around uh, making mess up, be able to push data into inside VM, push data into command. API is going to be a really amazing change for Metasploit to make it really easy to, to hook into other stuff. Yeah, right on. Nice. Thank you, Matthew. Flatlanders, um, Ruby SMB, uh, Dev put up a couple uh, work in progress PRs um, a couple weeks ago to sh uh, showing client use of the, the new code. It's very nice. Uh, the metal extension loader, uh, Swift keylogger uh, extension I've been working on. Uh, I did a, a, some review with Brent and Tim. Thank you guys for your feedback on that. So I'll keep plugging along on that. I ended up doing PSO shadowing um, some this last cycle, and uh, that was really interesting. Um, but took up, uh, so I didn't account for that when I was uh, thinking of sprint planning. Um, so useful. Uh, we've been doing commercial support this cycle, um, tri triaged MS, the MSSI tickets as they came in, uh, come in, and um, Dev also fixed a, a backlog issue uh, yesterday for for the commercial stuff. So good things, keep them busy. Mm -hmm. All right. It's time for demos. Oh. 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 Are any, any Aggies on the line or in here? This no, I had no idea. Yeah. Kyle. Oh, yeah. right now. I, I didn't know either. <laughs> That's <laughs> like when Astro. <laughs> that was when they were uh, doing the remodeling. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's an extreme remodel right there. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, so this basically came down to uh, I was trying to get a quick way to test payloads on esoteric hardware. So uh, I wound up just piggybacking onto an existing uh, module for SSH, SSH exec which just throws up a, <clears throat> a meterpreter session if you have SSH credentials. Uh, the catch was is that as we were trying to do some more esoteric stuff, I expanded the target list. Originally, I think it was just Linux um, and Python. I went ahead and added ARMLE, MIPSLE, MIPSBE, uh, ARCH64, and the two OSXs. And, and my two dogs are apparently wanting to join in on this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, I don't know if you have the picture of that, but basically, uh, oh yeah, you want me to you want me to put up the slide you added? Sure. Okay, I'll put that up. Hold on. Uh, I'm going to. Okay. Oh no, Inception. Oh, that's, uh, that's a fascinating effect there, Pierce. I'm gonna stop presenting and try that again. 
actually, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it. So right. Ubiquity is a, uh, is a company that does some networking uh, hardware, and they released a power strip that has an Altheros AR9330 chip in it, which comes complete with uh, Ethernet and runs a version of Linux. So it's right out of the box. You can SSH into it with default creds. And as you can see here, I've, I've literally just, I took this thing out of the box and plugged it into my test network. So, uh, and I've set it for uh, this particular one, I believe is uh, MIPS Big Indian. Let's see. Yep. So. Do do do. I do have to wait for a couple of seconds after we do this because for some strange reason, the, the chip that they put inside a power strip is not incredibly powerful. Um, so it takes a minute to get everything uh, situated. And as you can see, it's very kind of them. Uh, Aww. Isn't loaded yet. We'll try again. And I'll 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 wait a little bit longer and in and, and I'll keep talking over it and and maybe I'll distract people. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know. Um Kepler. A regular PT Barnum. <laughs> this way to the great egress. Hey, that's better. At least I have uh, the information along with it this time. Yep. That means it worked. Yep. And and notice how nice they were that that uh, default creds. Oh, it's root. <laughs> yeah. You got privs. Oh, it's two now. Oh. No, you're 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 just sessions SI two. Oh yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Or negative one, whatever you like. Yeah, that's a cool trick. I'm glad you showed Wait, it. What? You can do sessions negative one and get the uh, last one. Because <laughs> yeah. it it's just cool. indexes the array, and yeah. that happens yeah. to be the last element in the array. So, yep. And so here we are running Meterpreter on a power strip. Hey. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you, Brendan. No problem. All right, we're going to make sure everybody has a, a chance to present that wants to present. All right, one of you guys. I'm going to book you guys. I've here. got uh, like a three minute presentation. All right, I'm going so for clock it. Clock starts whenever you take the, the reins. Uh, where's the button? Present now. Your entire screen. All right, let's go. Let's share. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. So, um, what I'm showing here is a interesting new feature that we just added to Meterpreter. Um, that allows you to impersonate other processes. Now, I mean, normally, if you if you want to run Meterpreter, you want, don't want like Meterpreter to show up in the process list, right? So for my test, I'm going to just grab some process off my machine. So I'm going to do PS. Yeah, embiggen that a little bit. Oh, sure. Awesome. Let me embiggen it. Thanks. So here I just have a, a prompt. Um, awesome. And uh, there. I'm just going to look at the processes that would be normally expected to run on my particular computer that would be perhaps um, uh, Unsuspicious. Um, maybe Insight Agent would be a good one. Uh, so, what's it called? IR Agent. That's right. IR. There we go. There's a Rapid7 IR Agent. Now, I can't actually replace this binary because, you know, technically I don't have permission, but I can fool PS into thinking that's the process I ran anyway. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to. Um, uh, there we go. So what I've basically added here is a new parameter called process, payload process command line. And you can put anything you want in there, including the options. And it will actually, um, in memory, replace the name that the process shows up with as, as whatever string you want it to be. So in this case, I'm basically going to create a, a test payload that basically becomes IR agent with the full path even. Let's go ahead and start it. So I, I, what I'm right, doing right now is I'm generating the payload. Right, right. It takes a little longer than it should. Someday we should fix that. There we go. We went ahead and generated the payload. So now I have test.app. It's obviously not the IR agent. But if I were to start it, you see I started it as test.app. If I go over here, create another screen. You can now see I have two IR agents <laughs> running on my computer. And they have 
uh, other than the fact that uh, the the size of them are a little bit off from each other, one's running as root and one's running as me, um, they both look to be the same from like a forensics point of view. So kind of a neat little feature. It's actually something that's just built into all your OSs. Um, I haven't quite fixed it for um, process monitor yet, activity monitor, but that's the thing that we're gonna do next is, is fix that. You can see here it shows up as app. Um, test test that app. Right on. And it turns out with OSX, you actually have to rename the process in two different places to make it fully renamed. Wow. <laughs> but, but it works perfectly fine on Linux, Solaris, HVUX, um, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, and everything else I've tested it on so far. Um, so there you go. Very cool. Looks like a handy feature. And that's available in Metal? That's, that's available in Metal. So basically all the Linux and OSX interpreters for, for starters. Nice. Um, I believe the IR agent will soon actually, I was talking with Tyler Stiller, one of the uh, mm -hmm. IR agent developers, mm -hmm. and they're actually going to be adding some, some renaming support to the IR agent as well. So maybe we'll play a little bit of a cat and mouse sort of game. <laughs> right. Healthy cat and mouse. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Brent. Appreciate that. Perfect three minutes, by the way. Oh, look at that. Aaron, keep you honest. Excellent.